Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Monday, the 23rd of April, 2012, and we have Julie, Lindsay, and Vicki Davis here with us. Thank you so much for being here. Excited to be here from Camilla, Georgia. Hi, Steve and everyone. Julie Lindsay here from Beijing, China, and really excited to be part of the show. Thanks, Steve. You know, I think it's funny that I couldn't find find a picture of the two of you together. And I didn't search for too long, but five minutes, and I realized, well, this is just such a virtual partnership. Do you have any pictures of the two of you together? Uh, we have uh, a yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> just about 10. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I couldn't oh, find them. <laughs> if you go to flatclassroomconference.com, you might find a couple, actually. We had a lot taken um, last February 2011, uh, oh. probably the last official time we were together. So that's, there's some from there. Oh, I didn't look hard enough. But I also think it's kind of representative of your relationship and collaboration. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for providing this room. Go to wecollaborate.com for what is now the non-official community for Collaborate users, since I'm no longer a Collaborate employee. The class, Classroom 2.0 is celebrating its fifth anniversary. Lots of fun. Don't miss the PBS News Hour at Incubator Project. We've, uh, we had our deadline on Saturday for Classroom 2.0, the book. We received an incredible number of submissions. Just cannot wait to start publishing those. Really, really fun. Just delighted with all that's come in. If you are going to ISTE, and uh, hope you are, and hope you aren't jealous if you aren't, uh, do join us for a variety of activities there. ISTE is in San Diego this year. We have all of these shadow activities that the crowd does now, uh, starting with the All Day Saturday Unconference, which used to be called a Blogger Con, but we now call Social Ed Con because it's no longer just about blogging. You don't even have to be registered for ISTE to come to, to Social Ed Con. Then we have a variety of activities uh, after that, including a Global Education Summit now on Sunday, a three-day, I'm sorry, a three-hour unconference on global education, which is perfect for this crowd. Then uh, the Bloggers Cafe and ISTE Live, the three days. If you've never presented at ISTE and you've always wanted to, never got accepted, or there's a topic you wanted to talk about that's not on the schedule, you. We don't have the schedule up yet, but you can go to ISTE Live, you can sign up, and you can present, and we'll stream those presentations out. It's really a lot of fun. So Vicki says she's coming with her daughter. I'm coming with my daughter as well. Some of you have met our kids there. Julie often brings her daughter. We'll see. Anyway, kind of a fun family affair. Hope to see you there. And if not, please feel free to log on to ISTE Unplug and watch the stream sessions that we hold. We held the Social Learning Summit. This past Saturday, two days ago, thanks to Discovery Education, uh, it was really a lot of fun. 73 sessions, presentations from about a dozen countries, all on Web 2.0 and social media and education. Uh, it was free, and the recordings are free to watch. Go to SocialLearningSummit.com or just go to Classroom20.com and click on the Social Learning Summit link. Coming up uh, this year, additional virtual conferences, the Future of Libraries, October 3rd through 5. The 2012 Global Education Conference, the third one, November 12th to 16th. IRON is now the sponsor of that concert, the conference, the founding sponsor, and we're delighted with that. Uh, San Jose State University is the sponsor of Library 2.0. And it looks as though we'll be announcing in the next week or two a Learning 2.0 conference uh, hosted by the Department of Education in August. So really fun to see these activities moving forward. Also, we're looking to get dates for the Gaming and Education Conference and the Alternate Education Conference. We know we've been teasing, but we're still teasing because we don't have dates yet. Coming up on the Future of Education on Wednesday, Richie Norton talks about his book, Resumes Are Dead and What to Do About It. This is really a fun topic. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll drill down on kind of the, um, the personal web presence or personal branding on the web um, and as it relates specifically to students. Larry Johnson talks about the Horizon Report on May 1st. Buffy Hamilton and Kristen Fontecario talk about school libraries. Mark Bauerlund comes back to talk about the digital divide. We're going to talk about learning in ePortfolios. We're going to do a show on the future of museums with Elizabeth Merritt. Anyway, lots of fun coming up. Hopefully, you'll be able to join us for some of this. 
If you've missed any of our shows, they are all recorded and in full collaborate form in an MP3. John Hunter and Chris Farina, John is the teacher and Chris is the movie director, uh, came to talk about their new movie that's going to be on public broadcast in the U.S. starting in May called World of Peace and Other Fourth Grade Achievements. I'm so moved and touched by this interview. I um, just really highly recommend it. You need to get to know John Hunter. Uh, just a brilliant guy. Uh, Tracy Wyland Dalgenti talked about Society 3.0 and the impact of social changes on education. Mark Tucker talked to us all about PISA scoring, high scoring, high PISA scoring countries and uh, how we can learn from them. If, even if you're skeptical of the PISA test results, really, really worth listening to. Anyway, lots more there. Jennifer Fox talked to us about strength based schools all up at futureofeducation.com. So this is our chance to have you tell us about where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. Look for the star icon, the second one down. Double click on that and then click on the map. Feel free to shout out in the chat. Let us know the time and the temperature. While you're doing that, I want to let you know with this many people in a room, often the chat looks like it scrolls by really quickly. Just double click on the top of the chat window and drag it, and you can drag it out of that's its normal place, and then you can resize it by grabbing the top or the bottom and pulling it open, and it will make it much easier to see the chat. Lots of fun to see folks from all over the world. Of course, for a session like this, that's no huge surprise. Wherever you're participating from, or if you're listening to the recording, we sure do appreciate having you join us. OK, so I, I know that because of the little bit of a lag that Julie has, it probably makes some sense for me to direct questions to, uh, to each of you sort of uh, directly. If I don't, you'll have to pick up and figure out that I forgot to do that. But I'm going to try and direct them. And if, if the question should go to someone else, feel free to, to kind of trade positions. But at least that way, Julie won't feel like she's constantly getting talked over. So it's, this is a brilliant book. I mean, I, you know, did you guys set out to write an encyclopedia, Julie? Or, uh, or did it just end up that you wrote the definitive work on everything global in Web 2.0 uh, in a spate of uh, furious energy? Well, I think, as, as you know, I mean, the book was three years in the making, and, you know, a lot of love, sweat, and tears have gone into it, and it's basically the, the five years of work that Vicky and I have been working together. So, <laughs> you know, encyclopedia is a good term for it, but, you know, we just wanted it to be rich with experiences, and we wanted to include other people's stories and, and people who've been in the projects with us to tell their story and to show the impact that it's had on their lives, their teaching, their profession, etc. And it's the book's not just about us. That was our, our main one of our main objectives. It's not just about us. It's about how we're changing the face of education, you know, in a small way, and, and what we're doing to join people from around the world. So, so that's why. And you know, we struggled with our publisher. You know, they they got very upset because it just got so long, and we had to cut things out. And it was it was a hard hard work, really hard work, just to to get it to where it is now. Thanks. So you need to tell your publisher that it it truly succeeds. I mean, there's just no, I mean, there's so much information, you know, from the index to all of the links and the incredible amount of material and the sidebars. I mean, even from the inside of the front cover, it's just jam-packed. But I felt like I was, um, I felt like I had in my hands a seminal work. And especially, uh, you know, when you think about the, the changes in the world and you think about Web 2.0 and global education, Vicki, I think you both deserve an incredible amount of credit. Um, and I love it that, you, that the three of us have some history here. I mean, I, I will say I enjoyed feeling like I had some small part in it. Well, Steve, you know, you're actually on page three. We have Tom Friedman at the top there on page three, and then we have Steve Harkin there at the bottom. But, 
you know, I think that we wanted it to be an experience that was welcoming, connecting, and encouraging because it's time to, um, there's a great uh, older marketing book that's just been revised called Crossing the Chasm, and it's about taking it from your early adopters into mainstream. And I feel like that's where we are in Web2. It's where we are in global education. People are ready for some some things to happen, but they need to know that it's not just the outliers. I've seen some blog posts lately of people questioning, you know, the motivational speakers that speak at conferences, and, you know, I'm one of those sometimes when I get out of the classroom. Is, is, is all of this really real? Are these just stories, or is this really happening? And, you know, we wanted to tell the story of the classroom teacher because that's what we are, of, of this is what real classroom teachers are doing, and it's average everyday classroom teachers who don't have a lot of money who can do this. All you have to have is a community of practice. And I think the other thing is we really want to share the community of practice so that if we can all agree that these are certain things that we do when we have a global collaborative project, that that community of practice can scaffold it up so that one day we can literally have hundreds of thousands of students collaborating together and a community of practice of the teachers that would, would hold that up. Well, if there's one thing that defines the two of you, it is the word energy. Um, Julie, I, I loved not only the quotes from the teachers in the book, for sure, but I also loved, um, uh, in particular, the email that you sent to Vicki that's reproduced. Do you want to give us a little bit of the history of how the two of you connected with each other? You know, we first connected through the K-12 um, online conference in 2006, the very first K-12 conference, and Vicky was running a, a wiki collaborative uh, session, and I, I joined in then, but we didn't really know each other then, but then I was following her blog through the October, etc., and I noticed that she was, her class was reading The World is Flat, and I was in Bangladesh at that time, and, and my class, my uh, senior, uh, junior, I should call it over there, uh, computer class were also reading The World is Flat, so I left a comment on her blog uh, to say, well, wouldn't it be great to join our kids together and we we have a sort of a different perspective from the other side of the flat world. And so Vicky picked up on this and we got together, you know, we Skyped and we, we worked this out and the very first flat classroom project was born, which in fact is not a lot different to what the flat classroom project looks like now, except that it was a lot shorter, it was about three weeks. Uh, my kids and I went into school on the weekend, two weeks weekends in a row, uh, which if we've got people in the room, I know we have who have done the Flat Classroom Project. You know, we basically did the whole multimedia piece, outsourcing and everything across two weekends. Um, and yeah, the bandwidth was terrible in Bangladesh. Trying to upload a five megabyte video was, was difficult. You know, that's the sort of thing I was facing. But, but we did it and our kids connected and something really magical happened. So we sort of sat back and thought, wow, what just happened? And that's how it started. So it's also, um, Vicki, kind of interesting to notice that um, Tom Friedman and Don Tapscott both kind of play prominent roles here in recognizing what you were doing. How, how important was that to you? Well, about two weeks into the first project, I think Julie, uh, she wrote about a, a blog post that she was out playing tennis and came back and she had an email from Thomas Friedman um, two weeks into the first project and, and she contacted me and we realized that something very special was happening and and we were really flattening at the high school level. Um, you know, this has been happening in business, but and there's, there's some other places that have happened it, but we've really merged our classrooms together, and that was very, very powerful. And in that particular email, spurred us on to realize that we had something, and we needed to make it scalable as well as bringing attention to other teachers. So that was that was incredible. And then uh, we got ready to have our first conference, and just before it, Don Tapscott reached out to us. He was writing. Um, his uh, his book, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember which one we were in. We were in a couple. Um, oh, Net Gen, um, that particular book. Uh, Julia will remember. Growing Up Digital, thank you. <laughs> and uh, he, he wanted to talk about the Horizon Report, which has now turned into the Net Gen Project. And um, we actually uh, ended up mashing up the Horizon uh, Report that comes out every January with Don's Net Gen norms uh, because they were, they were just perfect uh, to kind of you know, we want to create, with that project, we wanted to create something you really couldn't copy off of Wikipedia. So it, it's amazing that those authors could reach out to us and help uh, spread the word with what we were doing and, and take it further. And I think that 
it also causes Julie and I both to want to foster beginning projects. And we incubate projects. We have flat classroom certified teachers. And our goal is to help as many teachers as possible start their own projects, whether it has flat classroom anything on it or not. Um, that's what we want to do because somebody did it for us is to pay it forward type thing that you do all the time, Steve, and, and uh, you know, we were kind of there, what, six years ago, kind of at the beginning, helping each other as beginners, and, and it's grown underneath all of us, And but we want to always keep the attitude of a beginner and being helpful and being encouraging. Um, you know, you, you do, a teacher with a strut is usually not a very good teacher. You have to be humble and work and help others. So, Julie, who's the book for? What's your ultimate goal? Who do you hope will be reading this book? Interesting question, Steve. Uh, the, the book is for anyone involved in education, and we've we've aimed it. I mean, the the seven chapters where we go through our seven steps, we're looking at the individual educator, we're looking at the actual school, how you can move the school, and we're looking at how the student, um, you know, what, from the student point of view. But you know, I think. It's for teachers in the classroom, all teachers in any classroom. It's for professional development coordinators. It's for curriculum leaders. It's for administrators. It's for teacher educators at the tertiary level. Uh, it's really, I think it's being marketed particularly at the teacher educator level. But you know, it's a pedagogy. But it's, it's you know, as you know, it's full of rich stories and and tips and tricks and uh, tools and methodology, etc. So. Um, you know, in a way, I don't know if that's a disadvantage being here, you know, Mark, trying to say it's for everybody, but, but I really think there is something in there for everybody. Vicki, um, the, the book has the initial impression of being sort of a guide to how to flatten your classroom. But it feels like there is a deeper story here, and, and one that you, that you kind of get at both directly and indirectly. The, the directly would be, this quote, many educators mistakenly view global collaboration as an extra, but visionary educators realize that global collaboration is not a curriculum topic, but an approach to pedagogy. And then your chapter on rock the world, I mean, it's sort of, I think you're sort of bluntly saying, what will happen if we don't make these changes? Um, do I, do I, did I get that right as sort of a strong secondary message? Yes, and I actually like to bring a chart up from the book. Uh, let me see. I think it's uh, chart number two here. Let me flip through. Um, it just this right here. We use it at this at the end. And you know, there's a, there are opportunities and threats. And and when there's massive change, you have you have an excellent opportunity um, to, to to benefit. Uh, you know, there's winners and losers. And, and we know of a lot of losers right now that are that are struggling. Um, but if you look at this chart here, and this is just for the U.S., and, and basically shows that in the United States, if you just look at the U.S., um, that we're going to have a shortage of, of students and of people who can actually meet our labor needs that we have. If we're going to sustain the growth we've had as, as, a, as a country, but also the growth of the world, we don't have enough knowledge workers. And where are those workers going to come from? Um, and, and, and how do we get students engaged? And how do we get them passionate? And you know, they're going to be using social media, and yet we don't let them use it in schools. And we we have this whole idea that a walled garden is complete. And I don't think you can have a world class education without the world. Um, it is time to change, and it's time to do things. You know, I think the biggest problem I have with a lot of the ed reform movement is that it, it's just a, a criticism. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. This doesn't work. And, and how many people are telling us what does work? For example, um, right now my students in the ninth grade have a what you could call it our freshman project. It's a Google 20% project. So we take 20% of our time. They have a year-long project, and they do an incredible work on a, a, a massive project. And instead of coming in and evaluating me for 30 minutes, three or four times in in the year, I've asked my administration, look at my student portfolios, evaluate me that way, and evaluate my student learning that way. So yes, OK, standardized testing may be part of it, but we need e-folios, and we need um, big summative projects. And, and we need to evolve in teaching, but there is a way to do this. Um, and there are teachers who are doing it now. I think one of my favorite chapters, besides chapter 12, is actually 
the chapter on choice, which is about differentiating instruction. It's chapter seven, because I have uh, two of my three children have learning differences, and there is no excuse to not reach every child now with technology. We have got to reach all of the children. Um, it is important, and you know, Bruce in, in the back channel is asking, what portfolio software do you recommend? Uh, we actually build our, our e-folios on Weebly, and they post their projects on Wikispaces. Um, we, we don't have a lot of money for that sort of software, but yes, there is an underlying message that, that you can do it. It is possible. Here's how to do it, and not just casting stones. You know, you know us, and you know that we really try to be positive, encouraging people. And uh, what teachers need now is hope, and they need to know that there is a way to do this. You know, the choice chapter was my favorite as well. And it didn't hurt that uh, flying back from a, 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 an engagement I had yesterday, I, I read Choice Theory by William Glasser, which just kind of blew me away. And then to read your chapter on choice in combination with that was amazing. But there's a story there of student empowerment and students making choices. Um, there's a, and you have a brilliant quote by John Turner. How important, Julie, is it, do you believe, for students to have choices? Uh, it's incredibly important, Steve, I think. And, you know, we, we actually we talked about this in our book club meeting yesterday. And, you know, this, this, this being able to differentiate between content, choice of content, choice of process, and choice of product is so important uh, to give students opportunities for personal success. And, you know, we talk about, um, and this relates back to Don Tapscott as well, he talks about customization of. Uh, digital tools, but it, it, but that leads on to customization of learning opportunities and learning environments. And really, you know, you look at uh, students now. I'm, I'm talking K to 12 in particular, but you know, everyone should be able to walk into a school or be part of an educational learning environment where the learning is customized to their needs, so that they can have success uh, as as and when they need it. You know. Um, you know, my daughter actually has a has a learning challenge as well, and she's she has struggled. She's just finishing grade 12 now. She's finishing her senior year, year now. She's got a month to go, but you know, she's she's one that has struggled all the way through school. And you know, I've bent over backwards to include her in flat classroom. She's lived the flat classroom as much as as she could in the last few years to give her that element of success and leadership and. Uh, ability to work with other people around the world, and uh, just you know, that's just one aspect of it. That uh, you know, it's something that every teacher. When we talk about differentiation, but I think a lot of the time we don't really know what to grab onto to, to put that in place to really benefit our students. And I think you know, part of what we're doing is is a solution in some way for many teachers. Over to you. So there is this piece, I think, of the student empowerment and choice. And there's also a really deep thread in the book around uh, teachers, um, their changing role, how and how things start with them. Vicki, you cite the Hawthorne effect in the book. Explain why. Well, um, you know, in chapter two, we talk about um, the, the the role that research needs to play and. You know, the problem with technology right now is that there's so many studies are coming out and saying this technology and that technology improves learning. And the Hawthorne effect, basically uh, in a factory, um, they started doing research trying to improve productivity. And they turned the lights down and productivity went up. And then they turned the lights up and productivity went up. And then they made it cold and productivity went up. And basically, every sing single thing that they did in that factory made productivity go up. And they found that it was the effect of being studied. So when you create a pilot and when you create a study, you create an environment of innovation that actually improves learning. And actually, it, because of just having that study go on. And you know, there are a couple things that you can do. You can actually use pilots to improve learning and spend what we call learning capital. We, we refer to that a little later in the book. Because you spend that learning experience on people, and you can improve learning just by having pilots. But also, we have the opportunity in global projects to sort of remove the Hawthorne effect. Because we have, uh, in, for example, flatclassroom.ning.com, we have researchers in there. And they look just like everybody else. We do have badges. But the students really don't know who the researchers are. And they're able to go in and, and see what's happening without impacting the final 
results. Um, and we need to have researchers who are able to do that. Of course, there are a lot of challenges with, with traditional research. And um, at the Berkman Center two weeks ago, there was quite a conversation at their open education forum about what needs to happen with open research. Um, but you know, I think that, uh, that it's time for, for, for research to evolve, but also to involve researchers in just about every global collaborative project. Let them see what we're doing. Let's see what the engagement. We know that audience improves learning. We know that piloting and research itself improves learning. So you know, we can use that to improve learning, but we can also neutralize the Hawthorne effect by involving researchers in these massive networks of both educators and students to, to really start to understand what works um, what works online. Uh, because if you look at, in particular, many third world countries, if you look at any rural areas like mine, uh, 5,300 people in shrinking, um, there's a great opportunity to improve the education in all areas um, if we can maximize and improve. And this whole personalized learning that Julie was talking about is part of this equation. Julie, every chapter in the uh, of the seven chapters of the seven steps, every chapter has a portion called self. Why is it so important for the teachers to look at their own practice? You know, it's really important because it's you know teachers need teachers need to be connected. They need to understand how the technology affects their everyday life as a professional, as a as a person using social media, and yeah, it starts with you. You've put it in the chat there already. It really has to start with the teacher because it's not uh, a matter of saying, OK, well, students, we're going to do this project. You hop on the wiki and I'll just sit back and, and assess you at the end. It, it certainly does not work like that. And our projects, our involvement in all of the things that we do with many educators around the world, we're very hands-on and we expect the teachers to be very hands-on as well, which means that the teachers need to have an essential understanding of what the tools are about, how we connect, how we communicate, how we collaborate, um, how we um, deal with, with potential issues, digital citizenship issues, and to be involved and hands-on at, at all stages. Uh, and I think this is, this is something that's really important. And it's, it's actually quite scary for many educators. You know, when we bring teachers into a project for the first time, it's often a steep learning curve. And when they get to the end, they say, wow, that was great. Oh, I understand it so much better now. I'm looking forward to my next project with you. Uh, and then you know, we know that we've, we've moved them along their own learning path and it's, we've been successful. Uh, the other thing we do, of course, is to uh, we run our own flat classroom certified teacher courses so that we do actually bring uh, educators in and run through many of the concepts, most of the concepts actually in the book and give them a head start before they join a project or while they're in our projects, uh, and that's you know we've done that to build up, build capacity, and build uh, sustainable skills for the teachers. So I'm glad that you brought this slide up because I was just going to ask you, Vicky, do you want to describe the different projects? There are in the book. Each one is listed with links and information about them. They're super organized, um, but it is a, a lot. And in fact, the incubator program I don't remember. So uh, I must have missed that, but go ahead and talk about them if you would. Well, uh, we have quite a few different projects, and actually we're missing our newest project, which is the K-2 project. That's a pilot. Uh, that's a kindergarten through second graders. They've been making, um, uh, I put it on my blog, uh, every every night at 8 o'clock on the Cool Cat Teacher blog, I actually post things about global education. and. Uh, posted a, the kids are cooking right now and recording what they're doing with cooking and we use wikis and you know uh, it's a lot of, a lot of fun with that the incubator program is actually um, comes out of our flat classroom certified teacher program out of that that uh, program the, the teachers are actually creating their own projects uh, together which is exciting uh, and we want to help birth we'll know that that the book is successful when we start seeing a lot of projects. Um, that that are born out of it that, that just thrive and, and grow even faster than flat classroom. Eracism Project is our middle school global debate that's going on right now. Hopefully we'll have the finals for that debate, which is hosted on VoiceThread. Uh, they're a co-sponsor of that project. Um, we'll host that in a virtual world. And of course, uh, a lot of our projects are free. So Racism, Incubator, um, the first time we run a project, we always get as many volunteers as possible, and we share everything we do. 
Uh, some of our projects we have to hire some people so that we have a little bit of a charge there. We've got our net gen ed project, which is high school, as well as the flat classroom project. And in those, the kids write uh, collaborative wikis together. We'll have 700 to 950. 950 has been our largest wiki so far. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is I know there are probably some questions about higher ed. And that is that uh, pre-service teachers come into just about all of these projects in different roles, expert advisors and judges and that sort of thing. And, and we've had some, some conversations about creating a project like this in higher ed. It's interesting. In some ways, it's easier to collaborate at the, the K-12 to level than at the higher ed level, because you have to do all these types of agreements at the higher ed level. But we do have quite a few um, uh, pre-service teachers and their professors involved in the projects. A Week in the Life is kind of our middle elementary project, and they share different aspects of their life uh, each week. So one week may be food, and another week may be culture, and another week may be holidays. And Digi DigiTeen is run through our nonprofit, which also runs our conference. And it is about digital citizenship. And that's one that we use social media, but kids under 13 can actually come in on that project. Uh, so we, we have two strands. We have one for 13 and up, and one for we have kids as young as 10 in that project now. So, um, But we've got, you know, the thing is, this is not about Julie and Vicki. Um, all of these projects are are run and managed in many ways. They're teacher sourced by the teachers. And then we have lead teachers who are certified teachers who help run the projects. Um, but the goal is to be excellent, to be inclusive, to be helpful, to be scalable, and to be excellent in everything we do, and to be very, very welcoming to beginners. So um, those are just some of the projects. Just follow those Twitter handles, and you'll find the links. So for somebody seeing these for the first time, this is going to be overwhelming. Um, there are, in the book, there is a chapter on designing and managing a global collaborative project. There are links to organizations, yours and others, that sort of do this in a structured way that someone could come in for the first time. I, I want to get into the seven steps, but I also want to let those who are in the chat know, um, I see some of these questions. I'm trying to note them, and when we go to Q&A, you can ask them again, or I'll ask them for you. I don't want to, I don't want to divert us too much from letting Julian and Vicky tell the story of the book until we get to the Q&A. So if it's OK, I'm going to skip some of these until we actually get to a place where we can do that. Um, Julie, what's the taxonomy of global connection? It's so funny. I was, that was the question I was going to ask, and you got it right up. OK. Well, this is about um, moving from the you know this, this, this is connections in terms of that in, within your own class we have this intra connection you're working within you and your students etc. Uh, then you start to move beyond your classroom walls you start to flatten the walls in terms of moving perhaps within your school. I mean sometimes it's harder to actually collaborate with the classroom down the the hall than it is to, with someone across the other side of the world. Uh, because of different things that are happening within your own school environment, but it's also an important thing to be able to do. You know, can your students collaborate with the class down the hall? Think about it. Uh, so, you know, um, moving from the interconnection with your school, with your district, perhaps, and district is sort of a uh, not a word that's used all around the world necessarily. Perhaps within your region. Uh, then, of course, we move to global connections that are managed. So, teacher managed global connections that which are way beyond your sort of immediate geographical area. Uh, then of course the next step, once, once you feel confident with that, the next step of course is to uh, student to student project uh, developments or opportunities with teacher management. And this is some of our sort of our middle school, high school level projects. Uh, we have students who essentially are self-motivated, self um you know, work, working independently, but with teachers in there managing, managing, etc. And then the, the, what we see is the highest level, um, higher order thinking and development of this is the uh, student to student with student management. And we're, we're developing this quite well with our Net Gen Ed project, where we have student managers and leaders. And this particular semester with that project, we, we have a lead teacher who's actually meeting with the students in Blackboard Collaborate. And these are students from different parts of the world. And the students are actually having a much greater role in the, uh, you know, what's happening in the project, things that they can organize and manage. And some of the outcomes are being directed by the students. So, so this is something we're very keen to, to foster with other projects as well. But, but as you can see, you, know, the, it, we, you move from the small, very teacher-centered 
uh, and then teacher managed to the you know, student independent uh, and yes, very powerful sort of management of the collaboration and the learning themselves. Vicky, what's the communication chapter about? Uh, the communication chapter, actually, let me get to the right slide. Um, you know, this is the interesting thing, is we started trying to map out how communications are, are, are sort of working. Um, we realized that, you know, we've got this, this, all the three types of communication. You've got intrapersonal, which is relating to yourself. You've got interpersonal, which is which is face-to-face -face interpersonal. And then you've got interpersonal, not face-to-face. -face. So these are the different types of communication channels if you look at communication theory. But we realized that there's this whole new kind of subcategory of communications called, that we call technopersonal skills. And, and this is where a lot of schools are falling short. Um, you know, I guess part of it's unrealistic expectations. You know, principals um, and leaders don't want any problems. They feel like a good day is when you don't have complaints. And, and they feel like it's an unknown. And maybe it's the fact that they're not as comfortable with technology. But, you know, we know that when we have kids in the hall, that somebody's going to bump against somebody else and there's going to be a problem. But we are zero tolerant of having problems online. The thing is, if, if there's ever a problem, my principal says he'd rather have a problem online than face to face because there's so much documentation that I can give him when it happens. So we've got to realize that it's time to start working in, online. Uh, schools must be bricks and clicks. And we talk about this even in the choice chat where you and Macintosh wrote a lovely piece about the seven spaces of learning in schools. And we also mentioned learning commons. I think that, uh, I'm not sure if it was David Loeschner that came in, but he's mentioned in the book as well, that we, we have to have bricks and clicks. And so students need to relate to themselves uh, using technology. How do they relate to each other using technology face to face? Are they able to relate to people and, and have good manners and that sort of thing? And then when they're not face to face using technology, are they able to do that? And, and this is really has to be taught. Students don't just understand how to relate with technology. It's funny, um, and it's really not funny actually. We have flaming that happens every so often. Of course, flaming is when someone is emotional and, and, and writes something inappropriate. And just this past week, we had a student who wrote to another student, you didn't turn in your outsource clip to me, and I'm angry at you, and my teacher's mad at you, too. And the other student ended up in tears. And we had to kind of work, work through that, you know, how do you have that communication? And how do you um, uh, work through this sort of thing? So techno-personal skills are essential for the modern 21st century student. And, and I don't think you can just get that in a walled garden. Uh, you, again, you can't have a world-class education without the world. And it's not to, talking to the world or at the world. It's talking with the world and interacting with the world. Julie, uh, Ed Greger wrote a piece recently in which he talked about the, the truly small number of students who do foreign exchange programs in high school, and even those who go abroad in college. I, mean, I, think, the, I think the number was fewer than 1,500 students a year in the US actually spend a year in another country. I happen to be one of those students who did that. And I feel like I learned some huge lessons about how what my own perceptions of the United States were and how other people perceived us, um, and went through a process of sort of um, uh, becoming less ethnocentric. I was kind of stunned by the quotes in the book about the impact of these programs on ethnocentrism. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. You know, and I think the the old the traditional model of physical exchanges is is a great model, uh, but we can do so much more now. Of course, scaffolded by the technology. And I just love Ed, you know, I've known Ed for many years and I know I speak to him whenever, you know, at various conferences and things, but uh, I know he's, he's struggled with this, as we struggle as well, you know, our, at the moment our projects are far too US centric for, for what we really want to do, and that's being very honest with everybody in this room. Uh, we are trying to encourage more uh, global participation, of course, and we have quite a lot, but it's, it's never enough. Um, but you know, the, the power of actually, as Vicky says, talking with other people, not at them or about them, but actually with them and breaking down those barriers and, and understanding that uh, in many respects, 
students are the same all around the world, but in many other respects there are, there are significant cultural differences that you don't really understand until you've had interactions with another person. Now that, that could be synchronous or asynchronous, it doesn't really matter, both have advantages, but until you actually understand that, gee, in the Middle East uh, they're always at school on a Sunday, why is that? Oh, and they don't recognise Christmas. Oh, that's odd. Um, oh, well, I don't have Thanksgiving, so that's really odd. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we sort of break down those sort of realisations that uh, people live different lives and have different family uh, situations and different uh, holidays and beliefs, uh, that, that really uh, true cultural understanding and, and the mentioned before this uh, global citizenship uh, starts to become you know, uh, evident. So, and you know, it's. Well, the one thing actually Vicky and I have started to talk about briefly is trying to meld, and this was prompted by a teacher in Korea who emailed us and said, well, why don't we do exchanges as part of Flat Classroom Project, why don't we do some physical exchanges between schools? And we thought, yeah, wouldn't that be great? Because that's a whole other level of organisation and whatever that, you know, we haven't quite got time to do at the moment. But yes, that would be fantastic. And anything that brings people out of their comfort zone and, and uh, for example, the conferences that we run. We've run a conference in Qatar, one in Beijing. We've run workshops in India and Hong Kong. And we've got uh, other live events lined up for next year. But, but these um, bring people out of their comfort zone and get them mixing with all sorts of people around the world. It's just an amazing opportunity. And there are stories in the book, as you know, Steve, stories of students who have come to our live events and have gone back with their lives changed by this experience. And I think, you know, that's, that's something that Vicky and I just really are so uh, firmly together on, that, you know, we do want to change lives, we do want to break down this ethnocentric sort of um, attitude that, that is evident in all parts of the world uh, and, and essentially make, a, you know, the world a better place through what we're doing. So, Vicky, those cultural exchanges don't happen without some friction sometimes. Well, what kinds of things have come up where you've had to address some particularly tricky issues? Well, you know, there, there are always challenges. You know, the very first project, um, I had a, t a, a parent, just as we were getting started, uh, that came and and said, had me in the principal's office with the principal and said that the people, the students from Bangladesh were going to come through the computer and bomb us. Um, and of course we dealt with that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds preposterous, but there's so much fear. Um, you know, it, it, there's so many great stories, but I think my favorite story is two weeks into our very first project, uh, my students lined up at my desk and they said, you know, Miss Vicki, um, we've got something to tell you. And, and I said, oh, what is it? And they said, well, we want to tell you that the news media is wrong. And I said, oh, really? They said, yeah, you have to learn to get to know people, and you can't judge people based upon their religion or their country because uh, the news media here in America says that all Muslims want to kill us, and that's not true, that we're getting to know the students in Bangladesh, and they're great people, and we like them. And, you know, they listen to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and they're cool people. Um, and, you know, we realized that their whole worldview was changing, and it was about two weeks into the project. Uh, and it does take time. It does take some, it, it is challenging. Um, you know, we, we have little things that happen all the time. We're always aware of cultural taboos. Uh, we have to, for example, profile pictures. Arms need to be covered on pretty much all of the students uh, because of the different um, uh, concepts of, of how things look. And interestingly, you know Terry Friedman, and he's in the book. Uh, one of my students, Casey, who was in the very first project, was writing a piece for him and was on Skype and started kept saying yes, sir, uh, to him. And, and in the south, in southern United States, uh, we, you know, we're yes, sir, yes, ma'am, that sort of thing. And, and uh, Terry, you know, said, uh, Casey, are, are you getting cheeky with me? Uh, it's, I, I feel like you're being uh, disrespectful. And they realized that a cultural disconnect was actually happening there. And Terry's a very seasoned uh, adult. And uh, the, the fact that she was saying, yes, sir, um, and that would be considered disrespectful in the UK, they happen 
all over the place uh, between adults, between students, and we have to, you know, one of the things we have to do is we have to teach uh, teachers how to step back and get to the facts because emotions run high and sometimes teachers can even get upset at each other. And the beautiful thing and why we love Wiki so much is we had an incident the other day where something had got deleted and, and someone had flamed a little bit and got their feelings hurt. We were able to go into Wiki and document exactly what happened. And I would say that probably 98% of our issues have to do with accidents, uh, people who have a technical problem. And if we can teach people to give others the benefit of the doubt, you always want to give another person the benefit of the doubt uh, when something happens, then that is a powerful thing to help improve our relationships everywhere on these forums and, and all these places where people are just having such a hard time getting along. If we can have some students who graduate from, from high school and understand good technopersonal skills and good digital citizenship, then I believe that we will reap what we sow today in the classroom. And it's why you know, we're so passionate about getting it into more classrooms. And it is doable. You don't have to be afraid. It is doable, and there are a lot of teachers who are doing it. So I love the chapter on creation, but I think we'll skip it. Um, and, and I want to ask one final question of Julie, and then we'll go to the Q&A. So Julie, why did you include the chapter on professional development? You must have, if you were cutting other things, you must have felt that was really important. Yes, absolutely. This is, um, we're talking about in particular chapter 11, challenge-based professional development. Yeah. Um, well, it's based on you know, what we've been doing in the last few years as well, which is the, uh, the flat classroom workshops, the conferences where we've run the leadership strand and the student summit um, and the flat classroom certified teachers. And I think it's, it's our way of showing that uh, we're working at the back end as well as the front end, so to speak. Uh, and we wanted to share some of the implementation, you know, some of the developments that we'd working with other educators around the world as well, some of our amazing colleagues like Kim Cofino and um, um, so I've gone blank, um, but you know it's just so important to to understand also that uh, you can bring this back to your own school in a methodical way and and develop your own sort of challenge based professional development uh, that involves uh, a process based sort of event. And we we work on um, uh, sorry, Benjamin Porter. That's your job. <laughs> sorry, just went blank. Benjamin's been a great help putting, you know, working with us, putting stuff together as well. Um, but you know, having say you know a day or two days or whatever, and working through a process. That's what our student summit does. Um, that's what we do with our leadership workshop, and not just one-off uh, lectures, etc., or one hour of hands-on. But it's an actual like this is where we're starting. This is where we're ending, and melding the student and the teacher. Uh, strands together, bringing them apart, bringing them together, etc. And we found that extremely successful. So that's that's what we wanted to share in that chapter and show that you know everyone can implement something effectively in their own learning environment that can move their their learners forward. It seemed like sort of the brilliant inevitable conclusion of the self portion of each of the previous seven steps. That, like Vicky said in the chat. Uh, it's sort of the fulfillment of those same principles and teachers um, doing all of those things for themselves and for each other. Um, it's so funny that you drew a blank on mentioning that name, <coughs> or on Berna Jean's name. Uh, I read your acknowledgement section and I thought, I think you've hit the Dunbar number. How do you remember all of these people? Oh, and I didn't direct that question. So oh, I didn't. Go ahead, Julie. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. Sorry, Steve. I think the older I get, the more I forget, actually. I'm, I think some people in the room might have, have empathy with me of that as well, which uh, I also feel like, Vicky, you know, I've just done overload so much, you know, and I really apologize to Bernadine. I know Bron's in the room as well. Sorry, Bron, you're a good friend of Bernadine as well, a good friend. I know, but uh, anyway, anyone, anyone who I've forgotten to mention, I apologize in advance. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's move to to questions. Uh, I've uh, collected a few. If you've asked a question, uh, please post it again in the chat or feel free to raise your hand if you want to take the microphone. That's the third icon over in the participant window. And uh, if you do that and there's no sound, we'll move on and let you run the, the uh, audio wizard. 
Um, but one question that came in, Vicki, was how do you deal with social media website age limits for elementary students? Um, well, you know, there are a lot of different options out there. I think you, you know, one of the things that we, we talk about in the book really is that it's not one size fits all. Um, you need to understand the country of origin and, and the rules there, and you need to understand your local rules. So, you know, wikis, and there are certain tools that have been very, very friendly to this whole issue we have in the United States with COPPA and having to have kids under 13 not be tracked. Wikispaces and Digo are two great places to go. You've got Edmodo that we use. There's so many different options out there. You know, I think the great thing is, you know, six years ago when we were really in had our first K-12 online conference, and when Classroom 2.0 was born, these were valid questions. But I kind of feel like six years later, they've they've been addressed with people who are are handling it. So you know, I would say look for age-appropriate experts who are doing it now and having success. If you can find them in your state, and pretty much every state has people that are doing this sort of thing. And emulate what they're doing. Um, don't you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And if you have a very conservative school, sometimes the best thing is to show them what it looks like. They're not willing to do like my um, administrators did when I sat down and said, "Oh, I've met this wonderful person in Bangladesh, and we want to study Thomas Friedman's book, The World Is Flat, and experience it." And I'll keep you briefed. And we literally met every every other day to brief them what was happening. We were watching it closely. I was scared to death. I felt like I was about to go skydiving, actually. Um, but you don't have to have that skydiving feeling anymore. Um, it, it's a lot safer now. Uh, it's a lot less scary. And there are a lot more best practices out there. Julie, um, Lisa asked, she says, I get asked all the time, what does flat classroom mean? Can we get a good definition? That classroom means bringing the world into your classroom and putting your classroom out to the world. So it means eliminating um, as many of the blockages as you can. And you know, I'm in China. Talk to me about things that are blocked. Uh, but you, you work out your own method of getting around that. You've got to put your students out there and in a safe and productive manner. And you've got to give them an authentic audience. You've got to give them people to interact with. And you've got to um, you know, combine what you're doing in your classroom with uh, other people in the world. So when, when I think of flat classroom, I think of this you know, sort of the, the walls being flattened, lowered, whatever. And it's almost like you're, you're teaching in the classroom of glass. You can see out. People can see in. And in fact, it's not just glass. It's actually it's, you, know, you can walk through it. And with cloud computing, with all of the tools that we have now, and all the tools we had six years ago, five and a half years ago, or whatever, when we started this, it's completely possible. It's just a matter of confidence and attitude. And uh, it works. Flat classroom works. Vicki, I felt like there was a sort of a second meaning to the flat classroom as well. It may or may not be intentional. But certainly, you're flattening the relationship between the student and the teacher too, right? Yes. Uh, teachers are no longer like the sun with the students and the planets going around. It is uh, it is a relationship. In some ways, it's like the students are the planets and the teacher is a is a the Voyager, uh, Star Trek Voyager going around the planet helping and coaching and encouraging the students. But it's a very different, we had a, a great conversation in our flat classroom book club uh, at 6 a.m. this morning actually about teacher evaluations and this sort of teaching because, you know, the teacher evaluations are very much structured to teacher-centered, teacher-delivered instruction. And, and we have to be evaluated differently when we teach this way. It's, it's just a very, but it's also flattening the relationship of, um, of uh, uh, pre-service teachers and, and professors and, and just a very powerful experience. In fact, the very first K-12 online conference where Julie and I met, uh, we had educators building wikis. And we had these amazing moderators of the wiki. And, um, and nobody knew who they were. And they were just they just thought they were volunteers. And we got to the very end and I said, well, uh, by the way, these were my 10th graders <laughs> moderating. And nobody could believe that the 10th graders had done such an incredible job. And once I took my students with me and spoke at the Center for Quality Teaching and Learning over in Columbus, Georgia, and I had my students in the back channel, but I told my students to intentionally not identify, you know, put that they were a student. 
and we got done and I asked the students to, to announce their IDs and, and the PhDs in the room were like, we cannot believe these students are this age. And it's so powerful when we level the playing field what can happen and how much we can learn from each other. Because you know the thing that students always bring to the room is energy. Um, and, and many of them bring excellence when, when they have been taught to be excellent and, and you know, students do what we expect. So um, we, need, we need to level in so many ways. And in fact, that's a lot about what Chapter 11 is about, that it's time to level our professional development. Um, I think as Dave Shresky says, the smartest person in the room is the room. But I would say that the smartest room is the flat classroom. It's one that brings in people from outside uh, and doesn't just harness the power of the room, but that flattens it. So I think David Weinberger said that, but I'm sure he's not alone in saying it, although we ought to give him some credit. Um, OK, so Jim Barton asks, and I think we, we may have covered this already, but maybe there's something more you'd want to say, Julie. He says, uh, this seems well suited to teaching about global citizenship. In what ways is that happening? It's the, um, the unintended learning, the unintentional learning that happens through our projects. Uh, for teachers as well as students. I mean, our, our project, we have uh, pretty much weekly teacher meetings at different times each week, so the different time zones have an opportunity to actually hop in. But it's that, oh, you do it like that over there. Oh, you mean you can't use YouTube in China? Oh, we didn't realize that. And it's this, this sort of um, unintentional learning, but, but it's also, you know, learning how to communicate the digital citizenship, global citizenship aspects of, you know, how do you greet someone professionally? This, and this is, this is not Facebook. You know, we do stress that what we do is is not, it's not a Facebook mode. It's a, it's a formal introduction. How do you, how do you do a handshake? How do you handshake with someone who's on the other side of the world? How do you sh um, introduce yourself and then respond to other people's introductions? How do you then move on to create a working relationship? Um, and a professional learning environment. And this is something that students and teachers struggle with, but it's something that, that is so important to, to what we do with our projects because it's not a social network where they talk about things they talk about on Facebook. It's not that. It's, it's developing a working relationship, which is so important for them to understand how to do that uh, online beyond their walls, their immediate walls, so that they can do that in later life when they get a job because this is so important for future employment. So, um, Dickie, what kinds of responses have you had from the students who participated in the program now some years ago? The first set of students, uh, you know, I have two examples. I have one student that's Casey mentioned in the beginning of the book, and she actually got into the honors program at the University of Florida, and the interviewers told her that after she was done that, that you know, so many things were equal, but the thing that had made it her, her different is that she had managed an international team. And interestingly, I had a, a student in that 10th grade class that was always a brilliant student but was always skeptical about all of this. And in that 10th grade class, I actually took those students into Twitter. Uh, and this particular student said, Miss Vicki, why are you wasting our tw time? Twitter is going to be nothing. And I think it was four or five months after Twitter started. I mean, it was very early. And, uh, you know, all these different things, wikis, this is just a joke. Well, now this student is, is studying uh, social media, and he walked into his first class, and they said, we're going to show you the future of, of the world, and we're going to talk about wikis, blogs, and Twitter. And he said he leaned over to another student, and he said, that's so 10th grade. And, you know, here he is, a sophomore, junior in college, and, and um you know, that story, he, he emailed me and he asked me to read it to my students and he said, Miss Vicki, I just want to tell you that I, I want to apologize. Um, I didn't understand what you were trying to do and I didn't believe you and you always told us that that if, if some people don't think, that, that there have to be some people, oh, I, let me go back, if, if everybody thinks it's a good idea, you're too late. When you're analyzing technology, if everybody thinks it's a good idea you're too late and that to position themselves for their lives to be able to profit to make money that they need to be able to find technology as it's emerging when when quite a few people still think you're crazy um, and to be able to spot that technology and and he said that you're so right and I want some students to be able to listen and you know some students don't listen some 
teachers don't listen, some parents don't listen, but I don't care if my students thank me today. I care if they thank me in five or six years. Those are the thank yous that I'm waiting for because it's my job as the adult to do what's right for them, to encourage them, to help them, to hold them accountable, and to help them be excellent for their future. And, and to truly, I love that this is the future of education uh, because uh, I want them to care about the future of their education. So those two, those two different letters and those two relationships, I think, have probably meant the most to me. And those were from the very first black classroom. And, and Julie will know uh, one of those students. I'll have to tell you who it is later, Julie, because she'll know. OK, that's a great way to end. Uh, Julie and Vicki, thank you so much, it, not just for the book, but the personal relationship and the inspiration and everything that you do. Julie, thanks for coming on so remotely. And, and we, I think we did a good job. We didn't step over each other too much. It's been a great pleasure to connect with you and with everyone in the room. And I think we had to pretty much most of the questions. I'm sorry if we missed out on some points. But uh, please contact us uh, and continue the conversation through our flat classrooms, Ning, or some of our other various sites, etc. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Julie. And Vicki, thanks so much. You've had a long day. Thank you, Steve, for your leadership and your advice and your wisdom. Uh, you know, this is one thing about you, and I know you, we, we have to finish, is that we've had many people who tell, have told us that it's not possible, it's not doable. And there's never one time, Steve, that you've ever told us it couldn't be done. You've always said, uh, think of it this way. And you've always said, this is how you can do it. And that kind of attitude, um, there's just no limit to what, what you're going to be able to do. And I just thank you that you've always been an encourager and never one of those to say, it's not possible. You're wasting your time. So thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, you've sure done a lot. And we love it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Julie and Vicki. The book is Flattening Classrooms, Engaging Minds. Run out, buy it before you do anything else, and be prepared for an incredibly uh, thoughtful and detailed book. Coming up on the Future of Education on Wednesday, Richie Norton talks about resumes are dead. And then uh, after next week, Larry Johnson on the Horizon Report, and Buffy Hamilton and Kristen on school libraries. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to Vicki and Julie again. Take care. Bye now. <laughs>